Thanks, everybody. Wow, that's really loud over here. Um, while you guys were playing Monte Carlo night, I slept in my backyard in a tent last night, so if I look a little tired, this isn't makeup. Okay, so uh, I want to talk to you today about a, a form of usability uh, research, or UX research, known as uh, ethnography. And what's with all the typography snarking in the back channel? Did anyone see this about kerning and all that kind of stuff? So I'm just gonna tell you right now, I don't even know what that is. And um, I went home and I stared at my ligatures for a long time and it didn't help. <laughs> okay, I hate the, um, the self-biography part of this stuff, but this long list of titles is really nothing more than to say, I, I think I know how to tell a story some of these jobs have, have really helped with the ability to tell a story, uh, whether it's through a video or an interface and, and hopefully in a presentation. So what is it about video ethnography that I think makes it so um, industrial, so, so heavy duty, so hardcore strength? Well, it's because of the, uh, the following. You have voice of the customer, and I, I think everyone in here can agree that when it comes to driving the user uh, experience tasks or, or driving a project team, nothing speaks more than the voice of the customer. Nothing speaks louder, particularly if you work for a, a customer-centric organization. Also, it's data-driven, and again, nothing clarifies people's minds on a project team like data. It's a, if it's reliable data, that is. If it's reliable data, it's a wonderful trumper of arguments. And then lastly, it's, it's using video. We are a television culture. Um, television is very powerful and, and it speaks very powerfully. Any one of these would be great, by itself would be great. But we have three. This is like a super group where if Jimi Hendrix, Sting, and Michael Jackson were in the same band, that's video ethnography. So, uh, and those three things are building what, what I call the cocktail of influence, which is really what this is all about. You want... Um, all of that research to, to drive the, the project in a way that, that you want your political influence to. Uh, anybody remember this, by the way? Anybody else raised by Bugs Bunny? Okay, yeah. <laughs> Cobra Fang Juice, Hydrogen Bitters, and Old Panther. That's your cocktail. Okay, so um, what, what is videography? We, we have to define our terms, and I'm gonna define them um, um, with, with this stuff here from Wikipedia. This is all to say that this gives us pedigree, it gives us license, it gives us um, something, something real to stand on, and it really gets real and important when we get down to that quote that I can't read on this little tiny thing, but uh, there it is. <laughs> and uh, that's really the pivot point for me, is, is, is ethnography is the social equivalent of usability testing. This is where it gets really interesting for practitioners in the user experience space. So let's go by, uh, down, down by the list, one by one, Observation, including filming of practitioners. This sounds like usability studies to me. Uh, study of observed behaviors for improving a product or service. Again, sounds like usability to me. And the use of obtained footage. This all sounds like usability, so we should be doing this. This is very, very familiar uh, territory, and it's not outside the grasp of anyone here in this room. So this is what and how we collect. It's basically nothing more than watching and listening to people. Putting this in the context, my team wanted to know how people and teams work together uh, as teams, as individuals. Uh, but the, more, the most important thing for us was to watch them while they're working because it really is different data that's collected uh, watching someone working versus talking about someone who's thinking about working. And so there are two types of field notes uh, that were out there to collect. If you're the eyes and ears of Jeremy's sensors, this is what you'd be picking up in the field. If anybody saw his talk yesterday, very good. Okay, so uh, describing the physical aspects of the work environment. You were really taking detailed notes of what you're seeing, describing in, in visual evidence what, what you see. The layout of the workstations. Do they have to get up a lot? Is it a lot of feet? You know, like the whole magic triangle thing in the kitchen? You know, is it, is it optimal? What, what things can be improved? I mean, not just in the screen, but you have to take in the rest of the... Um, of the environment as a, a, as a variable. Are they cluttered? Uh, do, do they use things? Do they need calculators and post-it notes and all those types of things to do their work? Do they have ample collaboration or areas to converse to work together properly? 
The other kind of ethnographic field note collection is, is the more fun kind, and that's uh, still and, and video collection. Um, and the quality of this collection is going to directly impact the quality of your output or your final report, which is what all of this is going to lead to. So taking notes is not enough. You, you just can't remember everything that's said, um, uh, the time it takes to collect and then analyze. You're going to forget things. You may have other projects you're juggling. So to go back to that visual evidence is, is extremely important. And more importantly, you have to have it collected in a way that it can be presented, be meaningful, and the key word is credible. You have to be able to put this out there if you want to drive influence in, in a meaningful way. So when we knew we wanted to do this, we knew we needed a plan. And if you work for a large uh, enterprise like I do, you, you always have to have a plan. It's the law. And um, we, we adopted this one from Kaiser Permanente, which I think is a really good one. And, and that's pretty much theirs right there. So we tweaked it not a lot. So let's, let's prepare for field work now, because um, preparation, I think, is, is where things can really go awry. So it's really important to take our time in this step. And this section can be best um, uh, broken down into the following three categories. We have goals, gear, and documents. Under goals, um, th this, is, this is the corner you shouldn't cut. And I know that sounds really cliche, but um, anything we talk about after this will mean nothing if you don't ask um, the right questions. Ask the right questions that, that, are, that are appropriate for your organization, for, for your effort. Uh, what is it you're trying to prove, improve or, or trying to solve? <clears throat> I heard this at a, um, a presentation at Adaptive Path Conference earlier this year, and uh, it, was a, it was a PhD anthropologist from, um, I think, the University of Canberra who works for Intel now. So their customer experience is headed up by an anthropologist. Think about that for a minute. I know it's Intel, and it doesn't seem like it's working too well, but I, I, think, I think they're in the right direction with, with who they want to staff to run that. And uh, one of the things she said is, if you're starting any design effort, whether it's a redesign, a new project, uh, coming up with experience design, just trying to come up with something new, where are your insights? If you don't have any insights, you're wasting your time. Your insights are your voice of the customer, customer's needs, anticipated needs, all that stuff. And I know I'm uh, preaching to the choir here. And this one's really important. You have organizational alignment. Organizational alignment means um, doing this with the backing of your entire organization. And I say this uh, especially to those in large enterprises uh, like, like mine, or, or like a large enterprise, <laughs> not necessarily like mine. Um, by that I mean, do you have um, the backing of your legal department? Because there is some, some privacy law issues here. Uh, legal releases for, for, for getting releases for a model to appear in, in film or still video, uh, still photos, um, that, that's a legal requirement. So you have to have a cooperation and support of your legal department, as well as um, organizational alignment with, um, of your organization, because this can be very expensive. It takes time to do research. Um, well, even if it's not very expensive, it still takes time, and time is money. And so unless people are aware of the time it takes, uh, and, the, and the legal ramifications and exposure, you can run into trouble. Another is budgetary concerns. And I said you can spend a little or a lot at this, but um, either way, you're going to have to discuss these things up front. And your, your budgetary concerns are going to, you know, wh how many people are going to do this and for how long? And uh, it does take time to edit, even the very simple editing that we're going to be talking about. Um, if there's any travel at all, travel expenses uh, can rack up, especially now. Um, the high cost of fuel, and gifts. And this is something we're going to talk about a little bit uh, in the lessons learned section. But uh, just like an honorarium in any usability study, you have to pay people for their time in, in the form of a gift. So it's part of your budget. And we'll talk about gear a little bit. And this is, uh, uh, I apologize for all the non-photographers in the room. This is going to be a little bit boring, but I promise we won't get uh, too technical. And I know the name of this is video ethnography, so, so why are we talking about uh, a still camera? Well, we are actually using DSLR bodies to, to shoot our video. And for that, um, for that, why we do that is because they're very small. Uh, you don't have to deal with cassette tapes and video or any of that kind of stuff. Um, and, and one of the more important features is um, the use of, of some of the lenses that, that really give us a film-like or a very dramatic quality to the video. Um, keeping in mind that you're generally going to be interviewing indoors, so it's going to be low light. So the, the faster a lens that you can get, um, we, we totally recommend uh, the, the 
Nifty 50 as it's known. Um, and then the other one, we actually did some, um, some previous work with the, the 1.8. Um, it's a good lens too. In fact, it, if you want to do this on a shoestring budget, you can get one of these for about $109 and it really, and we'll, we'll show this in uh, much more detail, but you get real dramatic shots at film quality. It doesn't look like videotape. It doesn't look like this was done on a public access channel, you know, with the little numbers in the corner and everything like that. Um, because we're shooting in video, it went with a very high uh, capacity card. I want to talk about that for a minute. Uh, the cards at that size we can have problems with, and I'll talk about that in the next slide. And then um, a, a travel tripod. I actually brought mine that I used, um, or I lost it. Wow, really? No, I have it. They get, <laughs> they get pretty small, and this, this does travel really well, and also makes a pretty good baton. Uh, that happened once, but I'm not gonna talk about that. <laughs> Uh, so those are the essentials. Let's talk about the, the stuff that is a little more um, useful in a pinch. Okay, so I talked about the, uh, the 128 gigabyte card issue. I had to buy this uh, six foot cable in, in a, a store in Paris because um, using the um, card reader kit that you, you can buy for the iPad, it, it would not read the card, which kind of freaked us out on vacation once. Um, because we thought, oh no, we just filled up this card, thousands of images, and it won't read. What, what's going on? It's, uh, it, it, it's, I don't know, something wrong with this thing. The, the long and short of it is we went and got a, a USB cable and used the other one that has the USB instead of the card mount, and for some reason, that worked fine. So just be really careful with the high capacity cards, but the catch-22 is if you're shooting really high quality video, you're gonna need a large card, so just, just be aware. Um, and, and in our case, we were doing some studies overseas, so we needed power adapters. Um, what else here? Uh, it's a card, uh, uh, a compact flash card reader. I had this little bag of electronic stuff, I swear. I have everything including like three and a half inch floppies and, and, and you know, con RCA converters. But uh, needless to say, that would be a horrible photo. Okay, let's move on. Um, and then, and then the iPad, which I find to be, um, for this kind of work, the ultimate in, in accessories. Number one, uh, you can use it as a monitor. It's amazing how great you think your shots are in that little tiny window and the camera, and then when you get them into a larger monitor, the, the, the tears that come when you realize, oh no, they're all soft, or, or there wasn't enough light, or whatever. Um, the, uh, the, one of the Genius Bar guys at the uh, Apple Store in Paris showed me the, um, the new uh, iPhoto app for iPad, has anybody used it? I mean, holy cow, I'm, I'm, why use Photoshop? I mean, wow. Um, that's another reason is that if you're on the go, uh, you, you can quickly get in there and, and edit these photos and it's, you know, this is a lot easier to travel with than say a, a MacBook Pro. Um, you can even edit your video on this thing now, especially like I said, we're gonna talk about simple cuts. So there's really nothing that the app can't do, um, that, that this nat the work of this nature needs. Uh, and then storage for maxed out uh, cards. And of course, data collection. I mean, you can literally you know, type notes and all that kind of stuff here. So it's, it's a really good travel companion for this kind of work. Um, and in planning, how are we doing on time? Uh, in planning, um, we want to talk about documents. You're going to need a call screener because you're going to have to gain access to the people with whom you're going to do these studies and uh, these participants. So um, know who you're looking for, know your criteria. So um, it's just like a usability test call screener, really. Then there's the model release. These are pretty boilerplate. You can get them anywhere, but particularly if you work for an organization that has a legal department, check with them. Again, underscores our organizational alignment. And then this one, um, I thought of this as kind of one of those things we could cut corners on earlier uh, in, in our particular case, and I'm glad we didn't because it actually uh, got me into a little bit of trouble on one day. And standardized notes, um, I'm not going to talk about it because that's a few slides away. But basically, to, to quantify your data, you, you want standardized note collection. So let's talk about actually quantifying the data. I said earlier, nothing clarifies UX activities quite like data. It really does um, put, put, put a lot of arguments to rest and, again, puts the customer back in focus where they should be. Now, the way you conduct your, your, your interview on camera uh, also 
affords you the opportunity to ask these questions in such a way that you can create data with it. So if you, if you leave them open and subjective, you're getting voice of the customer. And if you can close them and get them to uh, answer questions in such a way that you can, you can normalize that data, uh, it'll, it'll help with your uh, data analyses and creation. So some example questions like tenure. How long is the person doing whatever it is you're wanting to watch? That's easily, easily, easily quantifiable. Um, their current tools. This is a list, an array, another thing that can easily be quantified or turned into numbers. Uh, this, the, uh, my favorite is the overall rating. Ask them a rating about this. Ask them a rating about that. Do you like our product? Do you, how do you like the other person's product? Uh, these things are easy to turn into numbers and can drive histograms, bar charts, all that kind of good stuff. Feature sets, again, more subjective voice of the customer, able to create arrays. Uh, rank order of importance is another good one. And then asking them just, uh, to, just to delve into probe, anything worthy of mention, again, more voice, uh, subjective voice of the customer. So now it's showtime. Uh, this is where it really hits the, the rubber hits the road and, and you're out in the field. And so um, this is where it all comes together. You want to talk about um, getting the most quality out of your interviews so that you can get the best in terms of your video collection. And so, a little thoughts on uh, camera placement. Man, I can't read this one or that one. That was not a good choice of font. But essentially, lock the camera down, leave it still, um, get yourself good light, close in, frame up on the subject. Um, no busy backdrops, especially if you're compressing this. The compression artifact will look really bad. Like outside, if there were trees blowing around in the background while the person's talking, it'd be, it'd be horrible. Your file size would be huge and your files would look terrible. Um, think minimally, like you're shooting a documentary. And I know it's difficult um, uh, for um, budgetary concerns, but try to have two-man teams. Try to have an interviewer. It's kind of like when you see the local news crews go out. You know, you got the guy with the camera and you got the person with the microphone. It really works a lot better. But if your budget says otherwise, then you got to do all the work up front and then conduct your interview. And now let's look at an example of some of the work that we've done. Now, obviously, I can't show our customers or any of that stuff here because of the privacy releases and, and, of course, the privacy laws. But let's see if this is going to work. OK. This handsome gentleman is my boss's boss, Senior Vice President of Marketing at Sabre. Um, we did this video recently using pretty much the same, same uh, shooting techniques that we use for on-camera interviews for our research. So let's take a look at what you're actually seeing there. We did everything by the book. I mean, we shot it at eye level. Uh, we, in this instance, we, we went with a young, he's my second cameraman. He was camera A, I was camera B. And for this purpose, we went with camera B because it created uh, an off-axis look that we liked. We liked the person talking off camera instead of to the camera. Uh, that's obviously subjective, something we did. Uh, this, you, you can be creative with this. It doesn't have to be boring. Um, Again, we did the neutral background. The external miking is really important too, much like I'm wearing. And again, the drama created by the, the, that nifty 50. We've got a crisp subject and a very dramatic soft bokeh background. You can't do that with video cameras. You, you really need that sort of very, very crisp, um, thin uh, area of focus. And then so, um, lighting is your friend. Um, make sure you have enough light for your exposure. Uh, don't, don't mix sunlight and uh, uh, indoor light. You know a lot of this stuff already. Put, put all that Instagram training to use. You don't want this, no FBI informants. You really, this isn't good, by the way. <laughs> this isn't giving your vo customers voice. This looks like your customers are trying to hide. And then speaking of audio, um, these, this is one of my peeves. Um, I probably spend way too much time on the audio, so we generally collect it separately, and then I just go all crazy on it with compression and, and different kinds of stuff that would really bore you. Uh, the bath towels is a good trick. Uh, I've been to a lot of offices where it's just glass, windows, hard countertops and surfaces, and, and, and you, you want to get rid of that room sound, that ambience, so a couple of towels would be really good to hang or, or place on hard surfaces. And now, uh, creation of the final report. So let's talk about those things that you've collected and turned into ingredients for your, your final report. Establishing shots, uh, I couldn't, these are actual 
photos from our collection. Um, I didn't want to use external shots of the actual businesses because, again, I think that's too much. But um, th th <laughs> it's interesting. A lot, uh, more than one of the places we visited had these ancient uh, uh, airline seats. More than one of them. In, in the store window, in one case, and in one place, that's what you sat in when you talked to the agent. And I was like, what's the deal with these? He goes, I got them on eBay for 40 bucks. They're cool. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> but you see how this, this brings character, um, um, it, it brings the people in the report to life. They're not just, you know, a mugshot. Also, detailed shots of what you're seeing. Like in this case, um, this, this is an actual output for a customer. Uh, here we see extensive use of sticky notes, and these, again, are the kinds of uh, details you want to be looking for um, w when you're in, in there collecting your field notes. Pay attention to outputs. This is a binder that's put together for customers. Now, when you have all this collected and you have individuals that you've interviewed, it's, it's, it's a good idea to create a dossier. Think, think like a persona. Um, not prose, because you, you don't really want people to read this. You want people to get the gist of it and then put all the parts together of the final report. So not prose. And speaking of all the parts of the final report, it's very cool that it's a modular group of uh, uh, outputs that you, you can have so that they're appropriate to whom you deliver them. So you might give some people the whole report, some you might just give the dossiers, et cetera. And again, all our parts. And then more importantly, all of those things, all those activities that we said we want to underscore. It's data driven. It's, under, it, it's, it's voice of the customer, and last but not least, um, th this revolution will be televised. So this is our plan. This is the plan that we used. Um, we, we had our general research questions uh, in hand. We selected our subjects, both uh, in, our, in our case, some were in a call center, some were actually in, in individual businesses or uh, brick and mortar. Um, we collected our data, analyzed our data, assembled the report, and delivered our results. Yeah, so this is what we did. <laughs> Obviously, I can't share a lot because it's proprietary. So we wanted to study um, German leisure agents, um, in, obviously in Germany. There's not, I, can't, I don't know any here, so we had to go there. And uh, for this particular case study, we went to seven locations. And it was supposed to be seven interviews, but uh, as we'll see in, in a few moments, uh, that camera comes out. Some people really like to talk. So an office manager wanted to get in on it. So we had eight interviews, so we had a bonus. And this is just to basically indicate that we ate our own dog food. We adopted a plan, and we, we, we stuck to the plan about as good as we could. Didn't deviate much from what we learned from the uh, Kaiser Permanente uh, uh, kit, which is linked in the, the files when I get them online. And uh, as you can see, we just did it by the numbers. And again, I can't really go into what it is we did, but we did it, and uh, <laughs> well, because of it, I, I, this is the stuff I can show you, the, the school of hard knocks, all the stuff that we got wrong, uh, which is great if you haven't done this and you have the, a, a remarkable opportunity here to listen to my mistakes and not make them yourself. Okay, so one of them was we went to a call center. When you're going to a place uh, where people work and they have monitors with customer data like everywhere, that's not a good place to set up a camera. Uh, the office manager's eyes got this big when I locked down the camera in front of all those monitors. And so um, if you're faced with that, just, just move the location. Just, just go out to a neutral location, a hallway, a foyer, um, something like that. Also, privacy laws in Europe are much stricter than they are here. Much, much stricter. You, you may have taken some HR-directed learning at work to direct you to that fact, but they are much stricter, and so um, it, it had an impact on the releases for the models that we had. Also, if you're going to travel with a lot of lenses and stuff, you will get stopped by TSA a lot. In fact, every time. <laughs> every time I have lenses, the, the machine doesn't like them, and so um, this is important because it almost made me miss a flight once. And be very careful of what happens when you whip out that camera, because something can happen after, after getting that call screener and you got your people all set up, you don't know what you're going to find. It could be someone who gets really, really shy when that camera comes out. And then that footage is suspect, because um, 
of, of all the shyness. And then also uh, the other one can be, like I said before, we had people who just really, really felt like that microphone was time to shine and they got a little hammy. <laughs> uh, the other thing is to stick to your forms. Uh, creating um, notes, that not, not just take a notebook, don't take a field notes guide and write notes. You, you want to go into Word and, for, and b beforehand, have all your questions laid out and have all your, your, you know, one through nine, one through nine, one through nine, and circle them so that uh, each new interview, and like I said, we, we did eight of them in the span of the week, and uh, you, can, you can get lost in your notes. It's real easy to do so. And one time I, I nearly uh, overwrote an entire interview, which, which would have been bad for a sample size this small. If you're, if you're interviewing many, many people, okay, lo losing a person is, is like losing a day's work, and that's all happened because we forgot to save, or we didn't, we're, we're not using Mosey or Carbonite or something like that, whatever. Losing a day's work stinks. But in a, in a small sample size like this, um, a, a losing, a single, um, losing a single person can actually harm the reliability of your data. Additional lessons, uh, just whenever you can, keep the mic separate from the one that's on the camera because um, it just makes for better audio. Um, I wanted to uh, talk about a couple of these. Paying people in Germany was difficult because it's hard to take money out of one country into another. The Treasury Department has rules against that. So one of the things that um, we tried a number of things, I tried to buy them prepaid American Express cards. They don't like American Express over there. They don't take it anywhere. Uh, so I mean, one way we got around it is good, Am good old Amazon. Uh, Amazon, uh, it's, it's a testament to the usability of their site because I was able to order a, a, a bunch of uh, gift cards in German. That took uh, morning, all morning, but I was able to do it. <laughs> uh, again. Videographers should not be taking notes. I unfortunately was both taking notes and, and doing all the, the technical stuff. Um, and, and another thing that, that can be bad is um, even if you're on a shoestring budget, if you do this right, it looks really good and you do get questions from people like, how much is this costing us? And so you, you must be careful with that. And then some, some thoughts on video editing. Again, keep it simple. You don't want to be impressing anyone with you know, your, your dissolves and your fades and all that, and all this stuff I have in this presentation. Don't do that. Um, you really want to, to keep, think, I mean, uh, yeah, think PBS. If anyone here grew up, grew up watching PBS, you, you know, the whole, uh, what's that guy's name? The photographer? Ken Burns, yeah, yeah. Think Ken Burns. Very, very soothing. Not a lot of fast movement, you know. And when it comes to editing software, these are, these are three packages that we've used. Your mileage may vary. I find you can get really far with iPhoto, or uh, sorry, I, iMovie. Uh, you can pretty much do everything you need to do with that. Um, we just want to get a little clever sometimes. So in closing, uh, again, this is our process. It's great because it's not a lot. It's really intuitive. Um, this is really an important part, though, is your field prep. Make sure this is where you really, really um, ask the right questions. Know what it is you're going to solve, because like I said, everything else downstream from that will not matter a bit. <sighs> My pen shot for lists of three. You got your influencers there, your ingredients, and your supergroup members. OK, and my team, I want to talk about them. This is uh, the finest team in technology travel. I just want to give them a brief shout out. Uh, big shout out to my um, videographer, Young, and editor, who's done a, um, a lot of video work for our team. And uh, like everyone else here, we're also hiring. At this time, I'll take any questions you have. Yes, sir. You have an external, like you said, external mic. So uh, the, the whatchamacallit, the DSLR does not have external XLR or whatever, so right. how, do you, how do you do that? In that, uh, in that instance, we, you saw us using that off-axis shot. Uh, the other camera was, was a, actually a Canon uh, video camera um, that we used. And the question was, how, how can you go off-camera with the mic if you're using a DSLR? And it's a good question. Um, uh, they're, not, they're not making those yet in that way. So what we did was we had a Canon video that we used solely as a backup, uh, as B-roll, in this case, it actually became the primary footage because we just liked the shot. Um, but but the, the main camera had, had a mic on it, and it also had the, uh, the eighth-inch adapter so that he could wear a lavalier. So in that actual interview, you saw he was wearing a lavalier. We're capturing the audio, so then we have to go into an editing suite to bring the audio from that with the video from the other. So OK, you caught me. <laughs> yes, sir.
Okay, that's going to my next slide. Okay. <laughs> See, I'm learning something too. That's great. We d We've actually, we got a little four-channel uh, Mackie board that we've used from time to time just for that. So, that's right. So yeah, the Zoom is, uh, I think, 199 and so is the Tascam. Okay. Tascam ZR, or DR100 is the model. And then they make a whole bunch of other ones. And then Zoom also makes one that's uh, the Zoom H4N. And I think the new one's the N next or something like that. And then it also gives you a backup to an SD card. So like even if you blow the audio on the DSLR, you still have the backup audio on the Okay, recorder. cool. Yeah, I so. I'm not. Yeah. Gonna, I'm going to say that right now. Anything you can do in redundancy is good, obviously. And so this is. Uh, good. Yeah. And I could have made this a lot more technical. I apologize. <laughs> Apparently, you guys are more technical than me. But th thank you for the, the sharing the comment. Anyone else? That gentleman. Just a question on what kind of like your average length of time do you like for to do an interview, but also. Um, so the average length of time to, to do one interview, uh, you know, is it a half hour interview, an hour interview, and then when you're actually putting together your results into a video, what do you find is a good length that kind of illustrates the points you want to make without, uh, you know, just beating the dead horse? Um, since I don't have a lot of data points to call from, I'll just speak to the work that we've done this year. Um, and this was actually a compromise. Uh, we were told that um, when we did our call screener and we were speaking to um, offices, they're like, hey, look, this is high season. I don't know how long we can give these people up for both, you know, being stared at. Because people are going to work differently when people are watching them and, and shooting them with cameras. It's called the Hawthorne effect, if you want to look that up. Uh, very old uh, uh, industrial psychology concept. But um, we did truncate the time a little bit less than what we would have liked, and that's why it was 120 minutes to get both an observation and an interview. The interview for us was about a half an hour. Um, but I, I will say that it, didn't, it wasn't very consistent because some high season, I mean, sometimes the person might have taken one call in duration of our interview, so, or, or, or our time together, rather. So um, it, uh, it, it varies. I, I'm going to say what feels right. Um, keeping in mind, like a usability test, and I'll just use this as an example, I tend to test a, a session, about a 90-minute session. You know, you've got your, your introduction, you're getting them to, to calm down. Hey, look at all the cameras. What's going on here? Uh, you're asking them questions. You get them to sign the you know, agreement, the release, and you pay them the honorarium and everything. And so that, that eats up a few minutes on the front end. You do about three scenarios in the middle, and you, you finish up with a s summary of questions at the end. And that's a 90-minute thing. And after you get to doing that, you get used to how long it should take. I would assume that this is another similar kind of research after a few cracks at the bat, you're really going to know the proper length, particularly as it relates to your, your goal setting in the beginning. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. That's right. The question was, uh, wow, traveling halfway across the world, why would you only do eight? Or actually, the plan was for seven. Um, it, was, it was the interest of money and time. Um, we wanted to get away from the city centers and have city centers. So high rise places, small little places. And uh, the TNI, the, the, the travel budget said, look, we, we can only do this for a week. And so unfortunately, um, and the time it took too. I mean, we had to, it was snowing when we were there. So it took longer to get around. Um, you get to the place and then Every time you go, it's like, hello, how are you? Sit down, coffee, you know, <laughs> that whole thing. I drank so much coffee. And, um, and, it, and even though you're only supposed to be collecting, sensing for 90 minutes, you, you tended to be there for, you know, you bookend that with the introductions and, the, and we had lots of tchotchkes and stuff to give away. So we were there for a few hours and then you get in the car and go to another place, drive, you know, um, an hour or so. So um, trying to do two in a day actually turned out to be really tough. And we did on a, on a few occasions. Yes, sir. Um, did you show this video to execs or business owners? And if you did, what were their re reaction? Uh, it was it was very it was very uh, well received. It was um, wow, we haven't done this before, you know. And and so uh, yeah, it seems like a good idea. This is a, a zeitgeist where we are right now. I know it's under the rubric of innovation, but one of the things is uh, we have this big poster now in our area called the. Um, 
customer manifesto or something like that. So it's, it has everything to do with that organizational alignment. They're organized around you know, meeting customer needs and they just, they saw this they, and they took to it like fish like water, like wow, this makes sense. So it was very positive. Any other questions? A, a common, and I'm sure you could have gone on for another hour with more things, but it would seem to me that part of this process, and a lot of video producers don't think about this, is archiving the material and providing metadata so 10 years from now when somebody wants to look for material, they can find this because this is just a beginning step of many things you're going to be using. And uh, oftentimes when a project is done, the media is just on a drive someplace and nobody knows where to find it five years from now. So that to think ahead for the possible usefulness for the data probably ensures a lot of interesting work coming ahead. So you're saying we should keep this, not delete it then? Uh, what I'm saying is that it's important to have metadata, keywords no. connected to the material, and it, uh, you know, archived in an efficient, active way rather than a passive way. Absolutely. Our usability uh, labs uh, at Sabre uh, keep, keep a, a database of findings that go way back. And we're in our infancy with this. I assume we're going we're gonna to do something similar. But thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, great session. Oh, um, having done a couple of these, uh, I know of what you speak on the data collection. And the other thing that happens to my teams in the field is all this other interesting stuff is going on because of where you are. So it's really hard to focus on the things that you're there for. Yes. So uh, we developed in the teams that I've worked with uh, a method of coming up with focus questions in the beginning, your, your part about the planning, and then for your little dossier, we answer those focus questions from the interview, and then that sort of ties everything together. Right. And right. so that smooths things out and keeps people focused. Those dossiers are, are sort of the executive summary. And, and all of those, those quantifiable data uh, make a person for, that goes with each exactly. interview or, or a medley of interviews that have been edited down for, for purpose. It might be seven people answering the same question yeah. in exactly the same way, yeah. in the same words. You don't know what the impact of what you're going to find until you find it. Yeah. And that's where your storytelling is going to come so in. It's so fun. Yeah. And, and I want to say you're right. Having the discipline at the tail end of the study is ever so critical because after a while you're like, I already know what they're going to say. Why do I have to ask this? But you need to ask it. It's, yeah. it's like putting them on the record. It's like being a court stenographer. You don't get to play fast and loose with the truth. Stick to, your, stick to the script. Or, or just decide in the beginning that you're not. Whatever you, whatever you learned in the first couple of sessions, you're going to go change and do something else in the second right, couple right, like of sessions. Right, like a pilot, sure. But you know, have a plan for what you're going to do there. But the data collecting, I am so with you on having, don't just take longhand for being oh, yeah. notes. It'll kill you. You can't keep up. Yeah. Anybody else? All right. Well, oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Do you get in the scenarios that you're recording yourself? Did you get a chance, or did you get a chance to test out that if you just video recorded it and then you took notes after you were done? how that would work out, or were you trying to do both at the same time? Um, I didn't think of that, <laughs> honestly. I mean, it was just uh, kind of went into it, you know, reading the literature that we did. Uh, uh, yes, can we do this? Um, I, I, guess, I guess maybe there could have been shorter in duration, but um, I just didn't think of doing it that way. Uh, a lot of times what happens when you, to sort of go off that question as well, is that when you're in the process of doing video and taking notes, um, a lot of what happens is you use your notes as sort of an anchor point so you know where to go back in the video, especially in instances where you get really, really long videos. Like, you really don't want to sit through 45 minutes of video trying to find where this one spot is that you may want to observe other things in the video. Um, so that's sort of the reason why you want to, well, why you want to have two people so that you have someone who's constantly taking it and maybe even marking time down. That was one of the methods that we learned 
um, when we studied video ethnography in my methodologies class was that you, you know, you line up a column every 15 minutes, you write time down, and then you sort of keep notes in the right when you go back. So that way you know how far into the video it was, if you want to look back at something, you want to make sure you got a quote correctly. And I mean, it's all, it's all about finding that balance of taking notes and but taking video. One of the toolkits I saw had, just as you had, the, the time, sort of time code next to the pre-set uh, areas for taking notes. Um, one of the, my, my shorthand was whenever someone said something, I was like, oh, that was awesome. I want to go back and get that. Uh, I just star it. So at the, some, some of my dossier or my notes uh, actually look like, um, like I was in fourth grade and the teacher liked those answers or something because there's crazy little stars everywhere. Any other questions? I think we have time for one more. No takers. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. Okay, one more. Oh. I want to go. No, this one will be easy. Uh, with usability software, um, you can do timestamps with just a click of the mouse. So, you know, as you're taking notes or whatever, or even if you're just observing, something's interesting, you can make a click of the mouse so you can get to that point real quickly. Is there anything comparable in this type of recording setup? Um, I, I would, I suppose, I guess the, 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 the difference here, though, is the, if you think if you're thinking like Moray and things like that, or yeah, yeah. in that realm, you're, the person's really kind of. It, uh, how do I explain this? The difference between their fixed location and us sort of rolling up and, and creating like a, a location on the spot, trying to create that neutral area. And so they're just seated. I typically have. Um, I'm either, uh, you know, uh, either in notes or or on a computer. I prefer notes because I can go a lot faster. I can draw. I can you know. Uh, I can take shorthand. Um, so I don't know how that would that would work, other than maybe using the the timestamp thing. Really, just right. keeping a, a chance. Um, I mean, I could probably make a loud sound or something that would you know make the person editing the audio hate me. Uh, <laughs> well, no, it's not a loud sound. No, no, I mean, I'm saying, no but electronic mark. Right, but a sense yeah. that you know I'm, I'm really just sort of taking notes, not not longhand, but but with a, st a stylus of some sort. Um, I just don't have the capture ability to do that really. Okay. Okay. Just question. Thanks, sir. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much.